If you're in Karachi, everyone in Karachi gets held up at gunpoint. It's, it's a, you, if you haven't been held up at gunpoint, it's because you're the guy holding the gun. Like that's... <laughs> My name is uh, Sami Shah. I came to Australia in 2012. I used to be a journalist and a comedian in Pakistan. Some of my columns and, and, and articles in comedy had kind of uh, started pissing off the wrong people. Sami was threatened for making jokes about Islam. But online harassment respects no borders. And even in Melbourne, he found himself squarely in the firing line. It's like being held up at gunpoint in Karachi. If you haven't been abused on Twitter by someone with an egg for their icon, you're the guy doing the abusing at this point. <laughs> Uh, Karachi is a city of 26 million people. Uh, Australia is a country of 24 million people. So whenever Australians are like, fuck off, we're full, I'm, conf I'm like, full of what? Like, what? Full of what? Answer! No. If you have an online presence, which because of the work I do, I kind of need to, uh, otherwise I don't get ticket sales at my next comedy show, you just have to accept that you're going to cop abuse. Sammy is not alone. Social media platforms are part of our everyday lives, connecting billions of us across the globe. But they've also become a potent tool for amplifying and sometimes weaponizing all of our worst instincts, unfettered and unregulated. Jacinta Parson and Sammy Shah on ABC Radio Melbourne. I had the audacity to be the first brown guy doing a radio show. How dare I do that? So for two years, I was called a curry muncher. And then, for, you know, and, and I had messages coming and going, what is this, Radio Bangladesh? The current system, the way we're working with online spaces, isn't working for anyone except white supremacists. In Australia, if you are black, brown, or from a minority, you are more likely to be abused, harassed, and receive hate speech online. In the past five years, there's also been an increase in anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic harassment. And rise in far-right extremism parallels the country's attempts to reckon with a rise in immigration, all of which has been amplified online. You Muslim whore, nobody invited you to Australia. Leave now before we behead your mother and bury you all with pigs. This is a tweet that I received in 2015, so um, sort of during the height of some of this abuse. My name is Marion Vaisada. I'm a lawyer and diversity inclusion practitioner. It was in, I suppose, in the context of doing a lot of advocacy work in the anti-racism space and specifically around Islamophobia that a lot of the online abuse started and it's kind of continued since then. We're living in an era where divisive politics has successfully otherwise diverse minority groups and normalise xenophobia against them. I was getting inundated with abuse um, through every social media platform that I was on. Conflict cells, the algorithms that are being used is a way to keep sticking us, to keep us on the platforms, to keep us from going somewhere else. So there aren't really economic incentives um, for them to clean up their act, to be honest. Julie Enman Grant is a former social media exec who now heads up the government's e-safety commission, set up to protect Australians from online harms. I worked at Twitter for two years and, you know, I really believed in the view that social media serves as a great leveler um, and it will help elevate voices that have previously been unheard. But what I started to see day in and day out is that when unbridled or unfettered free speech borders into harassment and abuse, it effectively silences voices. And there were specific voices that were being silent, silenced. And, and they were those of the vulnerable communities. It was really hard and I remember fearing for my life at that time. My mental health took a huge battering. The sense of guilt that I felt um, at, at the time, thinking that it, have I potentially put not just myself at risk, but my children, um, you know, my husband, I think that in, in some ways actually hurt more. Miriam's case was nothing short of absolutely 
dehumanizing and crushing. What an incredibly resilient um, human being. There's very little we could rely on legally. Um, the authorities seem to not really have a grasp on um, social media abuse. I recall at the time some police um, attending my house and saying to me, you know, can you just not tweet? Uh, can you just get off social media? You know, and I did that for a while. That isn't necessarily, that is not the answer. Technology is evolving at such a rapid pace that policy has struggled to keep up. Governments around the world have been playing catch up. But now, Australia is at the forefront of the fight. The 2021 Online Safety Bill will hold social media companies accountable for the safety of their platforms. Government will be able to fine the platforms half a million Australian dollars for ignoring takedown requests. And trolls themselves will face fines of 111,000 Australian dollars per post. Had Miriam had these pending adult cyber abuse laws um, at her disposal and had had, had a, a regulator like the eSafety Commissioner, we would have taken down the, the content and we would have had powers define content hosts up to a half a million dollars uh, for each offense, but also to go after the perpetrators. That certainly is an incentive not to troll with impunity. Companies can either step up, raise the standards and put safety at the forefront of what they do, or they can expect governments to tell them what and how to do it. Social media is a reflection of the world that we live in. We all contribute to that environment and we need to take ownership and responsibility for how we contribute to that environment. No amount of legislation can make the internet completely safe. And some criticise the new bill, saying it falls short of addressing systemic issues. The iceberg analogy is something that I use to describe what we see on social media versus what's happening underneath the water. These entire systems are doing what they're intended to do, which is to, to radicalise and to drive division in, in many respects. No amount of legislation, I believe, will be successful. We spend a lot of time putting policy at what we see above the water and then forgetting that we've just had the hull of our boat ripped out because we've hit the iceberg well before we got anywhere near that, that tip, right? So we need to be thinking more about like what's the sort of networked environment that's happening under the water that's supporting some of this bad behaviour and particularly if we're looking at online extremism. The other big issue we really need to address that this legislation is does not really tackle is the broader systems of power that impact this space. So the systemic bias, the, the lack of diversity and inclusion in the rooms where these sort of systems are being designed, where policies are being set as well. Yes, the minorities of Australia, the people of colour of Australia are, are being left behind by government policy as they always have been. We as individuals can't necessarily hold social media platforms to account, but governments can. There is broader work that needs to be done um, with ensuring that we're not giving a license to hate speech. Yes, it would be nicer to go online and not be abused all the time. Yes, it would be nicer to not have, you know, uh, 8chan forums where white supremacists are trading clips of a school of a mosque shooting. But that's the, we're still trying to figure out how to live in this world, this 21st century world of the internet being so integrated into our lives.